gives a, a personal introduction of, of Paul. Um, I've been meeting Paul many times at uh, different VMware events, and um, um, the, the thing with, with Paul is that uh, he has this blog uh, website that has me that has been invaluable to uh, the VMware and the virtualization community uh, because um, as an IT professional you always want to test software and hardware and at home so you have your little tests at home uh, however with in the case of VMware what we've seen is that the manufacturer just uh, standardize all the, 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 the software to accept only uh, server environment and brand name environment. So one who wants to put together a white box, it's, it's rather difficult. So there's ways around. And uh, um, so Tinker Tribe blog has been very interesting in, in solving all those those uh, those issues, because there's always a good solution for for that. Then, uh, if you are to go and set up your own VMware installation, please go to tinkertry.org. That org. That org. And uh, we'll figure out what you need to do. Um, so. Do you know any other blog or, or website that does the same thing? Sure. Maybe? At the end of my presentation, I'll show a bunch different, oh, okay. of different links. All right. All right. Yeah. I got to admit, uh, yeah, yeah, my USB yeah. I have is too small to move the PowerPoint to their machine. This thing is blocked from remote desktop, so I can't get to it. Oh, I, I, maybe I'll get around it. Cool. That's all I need, and then I'm ready to go. Sorry to interrupt. Thanks. No problem. You want to bring a USB? Well, if you can get me in the network, I'm good. I don't know if I can block If I can already repeat it, yeah. That's uh, started. Is this Windows 10? Yep. Could you go to um, um, www. <coughs> <coughs> I'm trying to go the other way around. Can you enable RDP into that you machine? You want to look from here to here? Correct. Great. So I mean, they can use TeamViewer and stuff, but I would mean, just ask, can you enable RDP on this? I don't know. But, um, so, so if you right click here. If you can use TeamViewer, then that would be the right back. Yeah. If you right click on that? Yeah. And go to the system. Turning out on a desktop restriction. So the presentation has been focused on the ubiquity edge router light, uh, which I'm not familiar at all. So we'll be seeing um, a demonstration of, of this item in conjunction with the hardware and, uh, and the, the VMware ISXi 6.5. So there's, there's many, VMware um, made a lot of uh, product introduction recently around uh, the NSX technology and uh, the, the virtual SAM and uh, it looks like this box is able to do all that which is uh, quite amazing. So I can't wait. Yep, that's right. that's right. So if, if anybody has any questions, so we can interact with him sometime. What we're struggling with is uh, a lockdown workstation. That's what I was concerned with a projector that had you your sort of hosed. <laughs> That's what I was concerned. Like someone from the computer science department, so I don't get crap. Somebody wants to see if this works. Can I be somebody here from IT on cool. duty? Yeah. It's all add in everything. You can't do RDP, you can't do anything. Uh, mm -hmm. But this looks good. This is a good workaround. So you use a WebEx? Yeah, that's GDI. Yeah. 
Yeah, I just need the HDMI. You didn't need to have a Pardon? You didn't have to have a yeah. Castle Webex? No, I do. Oh, you do? Uh, yeah. So this is going to work. So that means we can join in too. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
once you have that router, then you can do fully qualified domain names. Uh, you can ping by short name, ping by fully qualified name, short name, short name, dot lab, dot local, both those work. Or uh, NS lookup, forward reverse lookup, by name, forward, and then by IP, reverse. So when you have forward reverse lookup, long name and short name all working in your enterprise, great. Well, here you can simulate an enterprise perfectly, basically, by getting all that working with an affordable router. And now, everything else about installing VMware is quite easy. There's no hacking the host files. There's certificates that have green chalk boxes. All that goodness is covered with a $90 box, so you don't need a Windows instance for Active Directory or anything. So that's a large part of the point of this traveling vSphere infrastructure. So I spoke to 12 groups last year. Some were into Citrix. They really didn't care that much about networking or even hardware. They just wanted a fast, affordable box that's basically a turnkey solution that they knew VMware or Citrix Zen or Red Hat or SUSE would work on just fine. And that's the motherboard that came out that I'm covering tonight. And we'll talk about that in a moment here. Again, thank you, Mark, for having me here. All right. So that's me and my path. More detail than we're going to get into here. But uh, yeah, it's long and convoluted. And I used to work at IBM Waltham for 10 years. Anyone ever been to the IBM Customer Center 4 for Wyman Street? Yes, I remember you from. We've probably known each other since the late 90s, right? It's been a while. Okay, well, that's how long I ran a Lotus Notes user group there. Whatever. Let's move on to today. All right, this was actually almost today, well, 2011. So it, Xeon was pretty unaffordable, or you can get a hand me down Dell server from work. This is five years ago, six years ago. That if you took a server home with dual power supplies in Connecticut and Massachusetts, you would generally be spending about $600 to $1,000 a year. So when it came time to shop, when I went with a Core i7, I'm like, wow, I want something way more efficient. I'd rather shovel that money for the next three or four years of my life into something decent that runs VMware well. So that was my first creation, rather large. RAID controller, 600 bucks right there for a decent RAID controller that ran well with the end of And then a whole bunch of uh, hand-me-down drives. Worked great, it was pretty fast, but still 150, 160 watts with all those drive jam, drives jammed in there. And when I run a virtualization lab, I leave it running. I know waiting five, 10 minutes for some Dell or Lenovo or old server to boot doesn't really foster you to actually use your whole lab. I don't mean just for training to get ready for a uh, cramming for a certificate certification exam. I mean actually using VM, spinning them up. So today I'm going to show you kind of the complete opposite approach, and that is this tiny little box that can fit a whole lot of drives in that small frame, easily portable and wheeled right in here to show off. Um, but I also leave it running efficiently without the guilt at home. Four. Well, here we go. I'll show you how many watts. Right now. Cycle so through the display. Admittedly, it's idling and only running two or three VMs right now. And looks like I'm at uh, 114 watts at the moment, but my laptop is actually plugged into it. So let's pull the laptop out. 72 watts for this little data center. And this data center is 120 gig of RAM. This is not a little data center, it's a beefy data center running a ZND. So this is not like an Intel Core i Atom, uh, Core, uh, Core i3 or an Atom or low end unit bus. No, this is a whole hog data center in a box here. So that's the point today. Um, there you go. I plugged it on the other side of the battery. So now this is all UPS protected. The other side is just my laptop, and that number is giving you a lot of readout. Okay. So that was the, that's not the focus tonight, but I just want to give you an idea when I try to tinker with hardware, I'm trying to find something that's sensible to leave running in a home for a fairly reasonable price point. Yeah, question. Oh, what is that UPS that actually tells you the exact one? I haven't seen one. Sure, that's Cyber Power PFC series. So if you've heard of power factor, correction, power supplies, if you don't use a newer battery, you end up plugging in some modern PC like this and you get like a buzz on the power supply. It's a bad sign. You got an old UPS and you probably don't want to use it with your new machine. Yeah. And so power conversion does the same thing. Where, where, yep. do you get, where do you get the buzz? Here's the thing though, 130 bucks for the low end battery, that the buzz would be from your power supply, not liking the sine wave output, uh, simulated sine wave. Oh. So you need, the, so 130 bucks gets you this power, uh, battery. Why do I have it? Well, I didn't fly, I drove, that's one reason. The other is, there's a USB cable coming out of the back that goes to VMware. So it knows if I lose power in the room, there's a VM that's running, it sees there's no power, shuts down all my VMs, then shuts down the data center when I have a snowstorm in Connecticut. That's the magic. 
130 bucks gets you a complete solution of free software. If you see wants more money. Cyberpower? Cyberpower, yep. So I have an article I wrote four years ago. I think 70,000 people have read that one. I was proud of that because I'm happy that a lot of people were begging for 140 bucks. That's a lot better than repurposing an APC big one and having to add a, a network card to make it more compatible. It's just more complexity, more time. This just works. Great question, yeah. Okay, cool. Let's move on. So you're, this is a picture of what you've got in front of you today. The build the materials is all here. So bam, build the materials, click that link. Everything I'm showing today, and actually I have live internet here, and it's fast thanks to this facility we're in. So my browser should come up, and there it is. All the parts, so what they cost, the right. everything, no secrets. The little see. box on the right is $90. 128 gig of RAM? No, 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 no. No, yes. Yep, so we're talking, we only talk about the battery so far. What's the uh, volt amps on that? Pardon? The volt amps on that. The volt amps? Yeah. The, I have no the, idea. The output. The wattage. The output. Oh, um, this one is only. Um, it's ready for something. Can you look it up? Well, the reason I say because the APC uh, backups RS is 130. And, Oh, there's huge ones. Yeah, you don't need it for this though, because we're, this is a thousand. Uh, but again, we're only burning seventy something watts. Well, my point being, it's a seven hundred volt amp. There you go, six hundred watts. That is, let's um, say, money, one hundred and fifty bucks. Again, the software's key. It's a shutdown VMware. This is not Windows running on here or something. Oh. So that's, this is a solution, right? This whole thing is running VMware really well. Alright. Um, and there's a USB in the back of it. All right. So yeah. It's all there, all documented. Let's go back to this. And I just have a deck of cards to give people a sense how tiny this thing is when you're looking around the web. You don't realize how small it is, right? <coughs> That's the motherboard. Here's my focus. It's a Facebook ZND story I'm telling tonight. It just so happens Supermicro put one out that's in a mini tower with a nice big fan, meaning slower RPM, so it's much more soothing to your ear in a home lab than a one u screamer with a tiny little fan whirring and annoying you. So that's the thing here. It's a Xeon D reference motherboard. Gigabyte and others ship them, but they te they are all a rack mount. Um, they are focused on the rack mount world, and that's again not the friendliest to ears. There's all sorts of form factors. You can stick them in a military vehicle and a Humvee. You can put it in an HP blade. So Xeon D is proliferated in all sorts of form factors. But again, most of these companies are only selling the naked motherboard. Now it's a much of a solution that's ready What's to What's special about Xeon D? Well, Over a penny. perfect question for what I was about to talk about. These are full-size DIMM slots. So if you get an Intel Nook, you're looking at so DIMMs, like laptop-style DIMM slots. These are normal size, tend to be cheaper. So that's one thing that's special. The other thing that's special here is the interfaces that we cover that. Uh, but you're looking at a CPU fan, it comes with a CPU fan, it runs fine with the lid off, I'm not overheating anything doing this, no big deal. And I'm actually going to abuse it quite a bit here in front of you where little blinky blinky lights are going to go showing you those NVMe gum stick drives doing a clone operation. What, but today what, you're a networking group and we're actually highlighting this network switch today. What, what memory goes in these? Robert, things? excuse me. What, what style of memory goes in? ECC DDR4. And this box was announced, the first ZMD series came out about two years ago, but they started shipping in volume uh, mid last year. They started proliferating, meaning they shipped in four CPU cores all the way to 16 cores. So the product line just grew, blew up. It started in the middle, and then they went smaller and bigger. So they go start starting price under 1,000 with no RAM or no disk, up to, oh, the motherboard, a high end, you can get up to three or four gram. What I'm showing you today here is about three gram. The price of RAM went up. It was only like 2,600 when I beefed it up with 120 gig of RAM or maybe 2,800. Now it's gone up past 3,000. That's just an industry thing. That's not a super micro or an Intel ZMD store. That's just the industry's hurting on RAM prices right now. Yes? Is that dollars? Yeah. So in US dollars, we're at about 3,000 something. Let me end it here. Yes, another question while I bring up the spreadsheet. Is the big cost the memory or the motherboard? Memory. The motherboard, the whole, this, yeah, let me show you. So I'm going to my website, look here on the server, and um, the price, well, let me show you the current price here, 12 core, the machine you're looking at here is 8 cores, we'll go off to their website, and 
Sold this as a complete solution with 64 gig of RAM, so I've added two more sticks, which are about $300 a pop. $1,800. So when I said three grand, that's because I have a whole bunch of SSDs jamming here as well. Okay. So the actual server, if you have drives already in your house and SSDs, you're getting started for as little as $1,850 with 64 gig of RAM. So that machine's completely ready for VMware. It even ships with a USB drive to install it up. So that's basically a turnkey solution there. Um, the question I get a lot though is, well, compare it to others like the Intel Nook, and that's what I've done here for you. So I made a spreadsheet and I say, here's how many CPU cores. And again, Intel Nook is a mobile CPU. ZND was Facebook's idea of how can I do an open air system and jam as much density into a 42 rack as possible, the proprietary, basically naked design. Shove a bunch of motherboards, make it really dense, power them all up with low watts per, and just fit as much compute grunt as I can into one rack. That's not an Atom story, that's an actual data center running production workloads, collaborating with Intel, who designed it, not Facebook, but with their feedback, and that's what they came up with. A motherboard that is very efficient. There's no more IDE ports, there's no more, there's no audio ports on it. There's no, um, you know, IDE, there's SATA ports, yeah, and they're all full SATA 3 speed. Um, there's NVMe in the motherboard. That's this slot we'll be talking about, the dumb state port factor. And there's a PCIe slot. What so is it, what are you gonna, we're going to cover all of that. But I want, oh, I'm sorry, so there's a bunch of questions. Let me show you one screen that's probably going to answer almost all the questions. There, I want to leave it there while we're talking. Yep? What do you think, I'm, sir, what's the difference between this board and your, like if I go and buy, buy a Dell? Machine, what would be different about 128 gig is outstanding. I and mean, until Nook, you're stuck with 16 on most of them, maybe 32. Yep. That's a big differentiator. Two 10 gig interfaces. Key if you're going to be trying vSAN, which is my day job now, working on vSAN at VMware. So 10 gig becomes important. Two 10 gig, two 1 gig, and a management port. So it's outstanding as far as connectivity in this tiny little thing. If you come around the back later on, you'll see little blinky blinky lights, and I have some green cables here. Mm -hmm. And those green cables are just to try to indicate to you that because they're attached to a port with a green light, these little LEDs are lit up green, that means 10 gig has been negotiated. So those are outstanding features because if you have multiple machines near each other in a cluster, you use that interconnect as your RAID array, basically. That's what vSAN is. So instead of fiber channel connections or SAS cables, all that stuff goes away. Now you just do 10 gig network. This has become affordable. Yeah, do you have a question? Um, when you went when you mentioned pricing, you flipped on to wide zone. Is that the sales side of this, or was that? Yeah, I don't, I don't fulfill anything. All I did was partner with someone I trust in Florida, went and visited him, worked with him. He had excellent track record of a decade of selling Supermicro long before he ever met me. He happened to get me the world's first server. I it was back ordered for like two months and shipped it when he said he would and delivered. Earned my trust that way, but more important, a sustainable, a repeatable procedure for assembling them, burning and testing for four hours, and shipping them out with a little certificate saying, yes, this RAM worked in this motherboard. I booted it for four hours and uh, ran a Linux load on it and ship it. That's a certain level of trust. When he's going to ship it overseas even, you really don't want a DOA in it. And so the way Super Mike, Company yep. for sales. Correct. So purchase from which one? An authorized reseller. <clears throat> Warranty, you can one year by default, you can extend it to three or five. They'll do cross shipping. So yes, authorized resellers are a little different than just buying an Intel Nook where you get it from Amazon and right. it ships and you have no warranty. I mean, you have no support or service really. Maybe 90 days, maybe this year, I'm not sure. You, you would be dealing with Intel directly. With Supermicro, you are dealing with authorized resellers that are doing a value add for you, assembling it at a very modest, like under 50 bucks or something for four hours of labor, yeah. uh, or four hours of burn and testing and putting it together and making sure it'll work. The thing is, the box that they ship, these are bare bones machines. So opening the box and resealing it, it looks no different. Whether it comes drop ship from Supermicro, I've had that from San Jose right to my house, or some test units I had for VMware last year, or ship from Wired Zone, it doesn't matter. It's a box with styrofoam and a plastic bag. Very bare bones basic, just want to point it out. It's not like a Dell machine with a thick manual and all the bunch of RAID control and all that. It's bare bones. It's a basic machine that's going to work quite well. Yeah, another question? It's not clear what drives what storage. Sure. Uh, this is showing you how many drive bays there are. So let me make it more clear by showing you physically. You've got these hot swap two, three and a half inch drive cages that come with. So remove the two screws on either side, put your 3.5 inch drive, and you can stick a 10 terabyte in there. All right, but it doesn't come with it. Nope. So bare bones means no storage. Yeah. 
So it comes with RAM, <coughs> CPU, and cooling and all that. It's all ready to go. Just add your own storage and drives. And, and you say that it does have a RAID control. So no, nope. uh, it's got a basic RAID control on the motherboard, RST, but that does not work with VMware, and it's slower. So people tend to ignore that. The thing is, my demo around the other side, right? I can in BIOS. I'm going to mirror two drives so that when you see it as one drive. You can do VMFS and join two partitions, but as far as RAID, here's the thing. I'm going to give you a demo of speed where you're going to care less about RAID. It's going to be so fast to clone a copy of this thing. I care if I have okay. a drive in there and one fails, I want, I, I want the mirror so the other one takes over. I, With, which operating system are you talking about, for instance? Well, I want to do it in the BIOS. I don't, I don't want to do it yeah, in the BIOS. Intel RST is very low end, you can do that. What? It's just not compatible with VMware. Right, so a lot of people want to need support for that type of feature. Yep, so RST is a basic BIOS. If, if, if any of you are familiar with uh, Core i7 or something for the last four years, he's right. You go into the BIOS, you hit Control, I, and you can configure a basic RAID 0, RAID 1. Thing is, it's slow, the rebuild times are slow, and it just doesn't work with what I care about, VMware. Now, Linux, you can do logical volume manager and join drives together. Windows, you can do the same thing. You can join a bunch of drives to be one big C drive if you want. There's lots of software ways to do it these days. Or you could use the PCI slot for a RAID control if you really want. It will fit in there. My old $800 card, I tried 600 I think, uh, mm -hmm. I threw it in there, it fits. It's tight. And it gets pretty goofy looking because now you got this thick cabling to jam this little enclosure. But yes, you can do it if you really want. Okay, so back to, uh, so four of those, they, you can buy a different caddy for I think 30 bucks each. That'll get you four SSDs if you don't want a 3.5, you can just go 2.5. Yes? All right, now you said this was a, Inexpensive solution to getting VMware on a server in your environment, Should. right? Relatively. Uh, right. Intel Nook is cheaper, admittedly. Right. Now you just said that there are certain options that won't run on VMware. It's not an add-on RAID card. Correct. Most people wouldn't bother in this little machine because you buy <coughs> on the motherboard. You have Gumstick NVMe. I'm going to get to that. And the storage form factor is so much faster than any RAID controller that it doesn't make a lot of sense to shovel that $600 to a RAID controller when you should just buy a one terabyte NVMe that's five or six times faster than any RAID controller. So I'll give a live demo of that and you, your memories are great, don't worry about it, kind of go away. And there's lots of free solutions by website, right here, storage and backup. The themes, the Kivo theme, there's lots of free companies that'll back up physical workloads like laptops and virtual workloads like Hyper-V or VMware. So, then you stop thinking about RAID so much, if you can back up and restore on a daily automated basis, it's not such a big deal to have this redundant array of disks where you can hot swap a drive on that. Um, and again, I want to make sure I leave time for focusing on networking. Help me pace myself. I've been spoken at this user group before. What time do I have till? So I leave plenty of time for Q&A. 10 minutes to 9. Pardon? 10 minutes to 9. Okay, great. So this screen has some bolded features. So. The perfect question was, what's special about this versus other machines? Now, we have ZNE, like three grand and up, rack-mounted stuff for the server. Yeah, for the, for the enterprise, great, and you have dual power supplies, but the watt burns are going to be a whole lot more, more than double to start. Core i7, and now there's Core i9 just announced. All of that is about 120 watts and up, and that's with nothing plugged in. This thing, you're looking at the whole data center for 70-something watts. It's quite different because, again, it, it's, it's a system on a chip where that is soldered on. You're not pulling the CPU off. The days of a socket to upgrade your CPU uh, are gone by the wayside, but there's some increased efficiencies doing that. And making your 10 gig right on the motherboard means you don't have to use a PCI slot. You got four network interfaces. Uh, you know, what more do you want there from a networking perspective? So pen testers or flexibility, one could, you could be uh, you know, a run a firewall with a dedicated WAN port going to your cable modem in your home, if you have sense or something. Way overkill. Obviously, this thing can run PF sensor. Crazy. But yes. Just to, to double check, uh, we're talking about the uh, the motherboard right there. Is that the ninety nine dollar? No, it's a nine hundred dollar motherboard. It's got a CPU soldered right on. So this naked motherboard assembly here with no memory yet is nine hundred dollars. That's why the starting price of this thing, without any RAM, is up above twelve hundred because you got the case, the power supply, and stuff to around this motherboard. So it's not a low-end motherboard like an Intel Nook. It's a beefy server motherboard. And really to that, you would add memory, and then you would add uh, storage. Yeah. Memory and storage, yeah. Memory and disk. Perfect. Great question. Um, 
Okay, probably a little hard to see in the room, but some of these are older, like 128. I think we covered the big features. Ah, another one. So suppose this goes, coming in. Suppose this is going in a corner of your basement, and you have no keyboard, video mouse, or crash card. Uh, you don't need those. When you first power on the machine, if you hook up a monitor to this for 10 seconds, boot it, right on the screen it says what IP address it got on the management port. Then you're done. So go and plug the monitor, stick it in the corner of your basement, go upstairs, point your browser to the IP address that you just saw that the VGA port told you it was coming up with, that and you're good. It's IPMI with no licensing. <coughs> so that's the mark that's already Oh, you see, we need anything, or I didn't need to um, ignore them. I sent them an email just to let them know. Oh, we're good now. Okay. WebEx is working. So. All right. Um, thank you, though. Yep. All right, so ILO. How many of you familiar with ILO? HP, right? IDRAC, Dell, any other hands? Mm -hmm. That stuff tends to require licensing, right? A nice little perk Supermicro does not only beats the big guys on price a bit, it's just bare bones without a big instruction manual, not as, you know, there's a reason it's bare bones. It's cheaper. But you have full management without any license fee with that. It just works. Yes? Um, Bad thing happened for integrated lights out, or the HP things. There was a huge contract for the multinational airline by a huge electronic giant, and they put out the factory backdoor password in their documentation, and it's been on the way through. Let me tell you, the huge on this is false. Yeah, there's there's more. Have you guys heard of um, V Pro and the vulnerability in Intel uh, Core i7 systems? Anyone hear that? Like a month or two ago, rumblings? What's that? IPMI, pretty ba pretty serious backdoor to laptops, like corporate managed, like that Dell right there. A Dell Precision 4K, $3,000 laptop you're looking at right there. That high-end kind of premium laptop tended to have the V-Pro chipset, meaning, oh, I'm a high-end workstation corporate user, and that had a serious vulnerability. It's nasty out there. I updated the bias, so I'm no longer vulnerable, no big deal. But my point is, when you have a whole, when you have older stuff, it can get tricky. ZMD doesn't have that. It is not vulnerable to that particular uh, hack. Um, I don't yet. So, excellent point. By the way, when people ask in the crowd a question, I guess at the end maybe I can hand the microphone around. Now okay, it'll pick them up. Just leave, it'll pick them up. Great. Yeah, as long as they talk out. Excellent. Thanks. So just speak loud when you ask questions. I guess so the camera can pick it up. All right. There's a whole lot on this super dense screen here. Uh, did anyone come up with any questions or spot some OS uh, that they're interested in? Because, you know, I wanted to record a video. Red Hat, Susay, uh, Freenas, there's a bunch of OSs. I tested all of them in a matter of three, four hours. They all booted just fine. They all install an NVMe and boot from NVMe fine. As long as your operating system was created in the last three years or so, it probably has a baked in NVMe driver, which is not SATA, not SAS, not SCSI. It's a new acronym to learn, NVMe. Non volatile memory express. That driver baked in means it can boot from it just fine. And the other key there is. I have a little trouble following what you're saying. So, sure. you install all these different, you install Windows 10, Windows Server, Hyper-D. Yep. Right on this gum stick here, the special memory format. It's not saving. But VMware can? VMware's fine too. I, VMware, I'm booting off of USB in the front. It doesn't list it. Right here, it's the only one the uh, VMware compatibility matrix. So yeah, VMware ES6 line. So, I, so this is, you booted these with a special interface? This is something different than a USB boot? Yep, these gum sticks, these naked modules here that look like memory, they're actually disks. Think of it as a laptop 2.5 inch drive out naked here. That's NVMe, it's five or six times quicker than SATA will ever be. This is SATA, old, down there is PCIe, new, a whole lot faster. NVMe is a new, Interface for SSDs. Yep. It's this thing right here. Yeah, it's on that card. So if we Google this, it sticks like a little more. That's a funny typo, but we caught that. All right. Yeah. Hopefully, that camera in the back it was too blurry to see what I just typed. Um, So when Samsung started shipping these drives, I had a 950 on back <coughs> for two months. It showed up. I blogged about it in the first week. And to my amazement, it got attention because I was the first one trying with VMware. My surprise was VMware just worked with it. There was no driver I needed to get from Samsung or anything. VMware was already installed in the box. I put the gum stick right in the motherboard. Today I've got a PCI slot so you can see it better. There's another third slot right down to the motherboard there. Installed it. 
format it for VMware as VMFS and put a VM on it and it just worked. And this article says, here's some of what I did. I turned the bias into UFI mode. Question. Roughly, they changed the, 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 the 14 fairly large drives. Nothing bigger than 5 terabytes, but nothing more than that range on one um, ISO 7. Power on. So how can I get those disk drives connected to this effective way? They're all mostly all US, not all USB, but some of the most are USB. But uh, the drives themselves are SATA. So you could liberate them from their plastic enclosure, and you now have yourself a SATA drive to go ahead and install the sled and, and slip in there. Yes, but that doesn't hold 14 drives. That is true. You might go with four 10 gig drives looking for a fire sale at Best Buy. They'll actually sell 10 terabyte enclosures. Inside might be a high-end Hitachi. I, I've got, um, I've, I have gone to the trouble to buy PCI Express cards with USB ports for 3.0, three ones filled in involving stages. Okay. Each one's got its own separate connection. Wow. Okay, that's a, it's a, instead of a $30 card, it's a $100 million card. But those, each one of those can be running, um, you know, Five gig over each one. And as soon as 3-1 types were kind of confused people, 3-0 is fabricated. So everything's 3-1, whether it was 5 gig or 10 gig. Standard people are going to be But anyway, um, <coughs> the first thing is though, USB, if you use lots of ports like that, it's already capacity to get to the, you know, in, in terms to the process, why is that a bad idea? Um, USB data stores, VMware doesn't support natively, so in my world it's a no-no. Oh, okay. You wouldn't do it in the data center anyway, but sorry, yeah? You repeat the question. Oh, thank you. The provider is repeating the question. So he's asking about, you have 14 drives, right, okay. roughly. They're in enclosures, USB <coughs> 3 attached, and it's burning a bit of electricity because each of those enclosures has its own power supply or it, it adds up. So. This would probably not be a great solution for you. Honestly, it only has four bays, unless you're willing to invest in 10, 10 gig drives, four of them, and you have 40 gig, sorry, sorry, 40 terabytes right there in this little enclosure. Admittedly, that's not a great solution because you're going to spend a fortune on drives. So you want a bigger case. You can buy the motherboard if you get a bigger case, by the way. Supermicro sells motherboards alone. So you can still do a ZMD, but you do want a bigger case to keep all your drives. I think that'd be like a better answer. Think, think, yeah. What if you use a NAS? I mean, could do that if you present your big uh, legacy array as an iSCSI uh, data store. VMware could pick up on that and use it as your data store. But it doesn't save electricity. He's keeping his old hardware running, right? Um, here, if I forget to repeat the question, I'll give you a throw that at me, remind me. Because <laughs> there'll be questions I got to remember to repeat them for that camera. All right. I'll keep going. Yes. You mentioned it um, <coughs> runs VMware into a part of this wearing. Does it also do Hyper-V? Yeah. Um, yep. And uh, actually, if you can add to that, you remember what you saw me do six months ago? At Microsoft. Yeah. Showing Hyper-V. I mean, so, and VMware. Yeah, you can go both. And it's good as an IT pro to learn whatever you can to get your hands on, right? So it's nice that I have one box that can run it all, both nested or installed natively. Um, I'm bouncing around, but someone brought up USB-C. There are benefits at home. I have a single cable now and a dock when I'm at home. My laptop, I plug in one USB-C Thunderbolt connection, triple monitors, charging the laptop, all of that. That dream has finally come alive. That's a laptop-style thing, not so much data center. So, is it rocket science to boot from NVMe? And the answer on this particular machine was, no big deal. But gamers that have like a gigabyte machine from two years ago, they find this article and they drop 50 comments. Those are a whole lot of people that don't, don't own the same server. And they frankly struggle with things like, if their bias was in legacy mode, booting from NVMe doesn't work. Oh, that's why almost all new laptops and desktops ship with UEFI mode. If you're familiar with that, it's a bit more well, painful, there's a bit of a learning curve, but guess mm -hmm. what, live with it. And Wired Zone ships them in that mode so it's ready for VMware without any problems. Or Hyper-V or whatever else the person's gonna put up there. These are great questions. So, okay. So yeah, that's a consumer drive. I want to be super clear. Samsung is taking the world by storm with really fast consumer drives with like consumer warranties, 
and not expecting you to beat the snot out of them with an enterprise workload for three or four years doing rights. They're not designed for that. They're meant for the home lab. They work great because I haven't come close to wearing one of them out yet. Uh, there's one of them I had for a year. I only used up about a fifth of its life in a year of heavy use of putting VMs on it all the time. Um, okay, so I just want to be clear. Samsung N50 Pro, these consumer gum stick drives you're seeing, are not ever going to be on the VMware compatibility list. They work, but they're not supported for enterprise workloads. Yes, question. How did you determine that you used up one fifth of its life? That was my next question. So, anyone have a Samsung product where they've run something called Samsung Magician? And the question was, how did I determine how, to, how much life it's left in it? So if anyone owns a Samsung product or SSD, their Samsung Magician free download runs under Windows and shows you how many terabytes written. This particular screenshot doesn't show that. The drive specs page will tell you TBW, terabytes written, what it's rated for. And the new drive's a 960, and they upped it again. I think they went five or six times quicker versus the predecessor, the 950. Both these drives have a ridiculous number of thousands of four, uh, four and a half stars on Amazon reviews. People are pretty fond of them. They're very fast. Intel is catching up for the consumer space on these little gum sticks that can fit in laptops, by the way. Uh, laptop has the Samsung NVMe in there. It's the same stuff you're looking at here. These gum sticks, they're kind of taking the world by storm. You might own one at home if you have a Surface <laughs> uh, MacBook and you just don't even know it. That's, those are NVMe drives in there. So how many of you have a Microsoft Surface 3 or later or a MacBook Pro or something? <coughs> okay, so a few people in the room probably already have NVMe or they know it. Yeah, you do. Okay, before we move away from this screen, yeah, any other questions about... How, how big can they, those be? How big are those individual gum Up to two terabyte. So my primary workstation at home is running a second one, I have an identical power, uh, with 12 cores instead of 8 cores in this one. And I run a VM in it with um, a two terabyte SSD underlying it. And that's where I'm doing producing my videos, all the content from my website is coming out of that Windows 10 VM. So yeah, you can, so the tiny gum stick goes up to two, te two terabytes. It's not 10 that you're looking for. When you get a PCI card and you have more room, and you put a bunch of sticks on one, now you're talking. And there is an adapter where you can fit four M.2 in one PCI slot. And through software, join them together. Uh, and where's vSAN is an example of aggregating drives with software-defined storage, uh, a software RAID controller, essentially. And like I said, Logical Volume Manager and Linux. How many people use Linux day-to-day -day in their jobs? Oh, not that much of the room? Mostly Windows people. Okay, how many people are using uh, Hyper-V often? An idea of who my audience is. How many of you are just playing Windows Server often? Okay. And it's hot in here. <laughs> I know this. So it's hard on everyone. We're doing our best. Thank you. Um, okay, oops. So there's a bunch of screens I skipped, right? Trying to get you to that page. Let me go back. Okay, form factors. Remember I said they proliferated? Uh, I wasn't kidding. There's little one you guys, something that's not much bigger than a nook. A nook is crazy small, right? It's this big. It's an inch tall or a little less, but it's basically a laptop jammed in a, a tiny case, right? That's why a nook is so small. Here's a super micro, has twice as many cores, and the price is, I don't know, 600 there. Here it's around 700. You still need to add RAM to both of these. So there's not a huge cost delta when you go to the bottom end of the ZMP. It's very nook like in price and size. Yes. So this could be a Acropolis with the community edition. Has it been tested with the um, uh, the mechanics? I meant. Has it been tested with the Acropolis hypervisor? Yes. It works fine. Um, yep. So that's a hyperconverged infrastructure solution. So VMware and a competitor, uh, Nutanix, right. they have their own hypervisor, and they call it Acropolis. And yes, it works on the super server. Uh, ZND, think of it as a reference motherboard design, Intel designed with years of life expected, so it's in their interest to have drivers and good support for all the OSs out there. Great question. Did I remember to repeat your whole question? <laughs> Close enough. You fixed it. Oh, so. Keep each other away. Throw that phone thing at each other as you go. Yeah, you go no, Someone's going to faint tonight. No? That could be interesting. Or do you migrate and hang out near the air conditioner? I don't know. Whatever works for you guys. All right, that not so well lit picture on the right is me at VMworld. I flew with all that gear, and Southwest doesn't even charge you per bed. It was pretty awesome. So I got to VMworld and had it in the vlogger area. Uh, everything Super Micro makes. They loved it to me for 90 days, which was amazing. Anyone get to VMworld last year? Very few. Uh, so lucky few. Yeah. 
Anyhow, and this is another picture where I've got a bigger 10 gig switch, and it's noisy. This one new 10 gig switch is a thousand bucks, and it's noisier than everything that's running up here. So it's kind of a shame to have that here today. I have a one gig switch from ASUS of all companies, not exactly who you think of for enterprises, but it's only 250 bucks. Here's the catch, it only has two one, uh, 10 gig interfaces, and the rest eight, eight ports are one gig. So it gets me a two node cluster, but nothing more. Three would be a whole lot more useful, or four would be easier. But anyhow, 10 gig is getting more affordable. I think by fall, like a month or two, hopefully we see a whole lot more products well under 1,000 for a Soho environment. Why? Because we've been stuck on one gig for like a decade and nothing happened. 10 gig the chip and putting it on a motherboard is no big deal for Intel or um, AMD to do at this point. So I think it's high time that uh, more consumer solutions come out to solve that problem. So the cable you're looking at, people often ask, and someone did already before we started tonight, uh, what is that thin cabling? Because it's a whole lot thinner than your typical Cat 5E cable. So that's Cat 6A or Cat 7. This particular example is Cat 6A by Monoprice, a company you're familiar with, and they call it Slim Run, the cabling. It can do 10 gig. So these blue cables are trying to show these are 10 gig connections. The server down here is 10 gig. This one up here is 10 gig. That's all I did with the colors. The cable's really nothing special. It's just color coding, so visually you can see which connections are 10 gig. Um, Nice step forward, what's the catch? It only goes to 14 feet length. But in a home lab or a traveling road show like this, sure is convenient to have a really small one foot cable that's really thin. You can imagine how ugly the back of this would look as I'm showing this off to you if I was doing traditional cable. Right, and it's pretty thin. A little bit of a rat's nest because I've got every cable, uh, every network port attached to it. This picture is a little clear. Yeah, question. I think they also have one that's more like a ribbon cable. It's flat, and you can put it right under the rod. They do. And is that um? I think it's only it's 14 feet. feet. Is that also monoprice or? You know, monoprice or best thing that we're in. Yeah, but it's not shielded, and never run any cable under our rod. <laughs> I think they put twisting <laughs> on each pair. Do you think a camera's picking all this up? Anyhow, keep it lively, keep it loud, it's all good. Well so the out. This is not <laughs> all right, so yes, 14 foot restriction, but yes, CAT 6 I expect, meaning it has to be able to do 10 gig and it works. It's not something I can use for longer than 14 feet in my house, I'm going with traditional cabling then, but that cabling has gotten real cheap too. Okay, this picture is trying to be a little clearer. When you have a two node cluster, how do you do it? Well, there's one 10 gig and another, because the switch I'm with here, the $250 AC switch, it only has two 10 gig ports but that lets the machines see each other. Here's the thing, VMware in the vSAM product that I worked on as part of my day job, now allows Direct Connect and it's fully supported. You can do away with a 10 gig switch. So imagine um, a small business just wants two machines like this near each other. You can cluster them with a direct attached connection and this isn't a super micro ZND story, it's, it's a robo solution, a remote office branch office where if someone's trying to do something like vSAM, an enterprise product from VMware, in their small locations, like 10,000 retail stores, for instance, dollars and cents matter a whole lot, including if they don't want to buy a 10 gig switch, it would be cool to just a $6 patch cable, a CAT 6A cable, straight between the two machines. So the world has moved forward with that. Auto crossover has been true with 1 gig for years, but 10 gig is also true. You don't need a switch. You can just directly attach two servers to each other and have a pretty astounding interconnect. No need for InfiniBand or fiber channel. No cross special cable, cross auto crossover. No, nope. it doesn't need to be crossover cable, just auto crossover. Intel drivers have done that for many years. Um, yep, glad you brought that up. So yeah, um, typically almost anything shipped for well, almost for quite a while, even in the one gig world, would do auto crossover, not a special cable. <coughs> or the 10 100 board would be a special cable. Okay, and why is one machine using more than the other? Because remember I said my traveling roadshow is eight core, my one at home is a little more expensive, 12 core. It looks exactly the same. You can't see a difference. Other than the fan height is a little higher. The CPU cooler is a little bigger. Question, yes? Several years ago, an ISP I know in New Hampshire was telling me about using only certain versions of VMware software because you've got it essentially for free, or if you've got anything bigger, it costs too much, it's cheaper to put in more servers and run lower cost licenses or something. Does that make ring any bells? And for home people, find what's the cheapest things you can play with or are those some freebies?
So eval experience. Um, this article, to my surprise, also well before I worked at VMware, got a lot of attention. So much so that the person that leads the VMware said, Paul, uh, you know, uh, can you work with us on publishing a new version now that we're updating the program? So <coughs> DMTN, if anyone heard of it a few years ago, was similar to TechNet or MSDN. How many people have ever had MSDN in their whole career? I had it for like 18 years myself, and now I got it again with my job. Yep, so that's a lot, that's more than half the room, right? So VMware's product uh, offering up until a few years ago was called the MTN Center. So they did away with it. Flash forward to today, about $180 gets you no more time buy-in for a year, where you can run VMs in a cluster, move them between, you can have all those enterprise-like features, and the catch is every, every year, you'd want to re-up it for another 180 bucks to keep your cluster going, as long as it's not production workloads. What your friend was referring to, and I'll repeat that part of the question, was, is there a free hypervisor, a, a way to do this on the cheap? There is, but you're very restricted. You lose a lot of the benefits of virtualization. For instance, you can run 10 VMs easily on this machine, but you can't move them around or move them from one drive to another magically while they're running. You lose a lot of the fun stuff in VMware. But yes, the free hypervisor is still available, and you can run it. Um, it's a confusing thing with licensing. It's a whole other matter. But this is much more recommended. If you're serious about your career and you work with VMware at work, I wholeheartedly would recommend just go with you know, experience, about 80 bucks a year. And I'll show you how you Well, you can also, also so That's the latest and greatest? The well, free, here's the new one. The free version that has 90 days. Does that just be high it's everything. It's, it's, uh, oh, this is uh, and it's uh, XBC, and there's a whole lot in there besides just hypervising. Yeah. No. The free one. The free one. Yeah, the free one's just hypervising. Yep. That's, so it's designed for like you point your browser to one machine and you put VMs on it. That's it. That's the free hypervisor. You have multiple machines. You want to manage them with like a single pane of glass is the cliche term. The that would be vSphere cluster. With, with the free one also, they don't have the backup APIs or whatever. So they yeah, there's they some other restrictions there too. You can manually back it up. Yeah. Yep, some products will refuse to mm -hmm. back up. Yep. Okay. So if you've ever heard of vSAN, virtual SAN was the former term, now it's called vSAN. That's this. And this stuff, the very latest bit. So I was very happy, May 1st, uh, day and date they announced this, to have this article ready and say, hey world, They've really dramatically improved the VMUG Manage program. It's shipping the very latest bits. Then I had a little fun with it. I actually recorded a video. This is me at VMUG Boston. How many of you went to VMUG Boston? Oh, yeah, okay. Three, three people in the room. And look at this. They even marketed for home labs, right? So a website like mine, where I have six years of my life invested in hundreds of articles, really nice to be able to highlight a product like this that may, helps an IT pro not have time hops. Because at IBM, I didn't get free license keys either. Just like any, any IT worker, it's very tough to run a home lab if the darn thing has a 60 day license uh, a time bomb on it, right? Um, or just uninstall and reinstall. <laughs> yep, you could. It takes time. A lot of people, you know, time you is an issue. This was a little bit fun here, and here's me bragging about the router. I ended up downloading it much faster than VMware's own site. So it's a third party that runs Eagle Experience, and they're hosting it on such a fast cloud server. Uh, it was kind of Funny how fast it was. I'm sure they had tweeted it or something. There you go. Yeah, that's okay. Um, okay. So yeah, the question was licensing. And I think I covered that enough. Let's move on. Can I ask you a question about your website? Um, sure. Are, do you do advertising on your website, or is it is mostly just? I do. Me. It's hard out there. <laughs> it costs money to run a website, and once you draw eyeballs and start succeeding at it. It costs more money, <laughs> and people want to do ad blocking. So yes, these are very, your question was about do I run ads? I do. Um, Veeam. Veeam sponsored, meaning they bought an ad after I'd already blogged about them for a long time and written many articles because I was using their free backup. That's a much better relationship when a company comes and buys an ad after you've already blogged on it. Not a sponsored post, not anything. My blog posts tend to be 95% plus of the time, stuff I've used for a month or two that I blog about or even a year. That's a unique blog post. It's not uh, a press blur where I just repeat what the press announcement said and I get in my hands in the product. So my, they're not really reviews, they're more like, here's an experience in the product the last three months of my life was like. So um, I like it when an advertiser likes my mode of operation that way. Not so fond of it when they try to steer me to write an article about their product. Yeah. I'm busy like all of you. I'm an IT pro making a living by day. 
and you know, two kids in college, all those pressures. So being able to do it completely for free, it would be really tough. Having advertisers that let me travel to 12 different user groups last year and funded that, rather than pulling from my family, it was a big deal. I'm super thankful to them. And I'm picky about who's, who's there. I'll reject ones that just are janky or don't have money. So and it, do they do they base their um, payments for ads? It, what's their way of deciding how much they pay you, or how much you decide how much to charge? Yeah, it's here's all fine. I don't have to talk to them too much, which is kind of cool. That sounds <laughs> kind of kind of hostile, but um, because people tend to use buy sell ads, so think of it as kind of a a place you go to get your ads. So someone will go here to buy sell ads and say, ah. I want to spend thousands to place it out in all the top virtualization blocks for next month and see how it goes. Suddenly, an ad shows up on my site. I have a click, uh, a click and approve, or click and decline it, and uh, that's how it works. Thank I'm probably getting too into the weeds with advertising, but yeah, it's an important part of running a website because there's hosting bills. And when you have tens of thousands of people looking at videos and stuff and pulling down media, you start to get hit with charges for the global audience actually looking at your stuff. Uh, nice problem to have. It, it, it took years. Um, this was fun. The 12 core model uh, was partly it was because of some voting I did. I put a Twitter poll out there. I tweeted it out. Um, around 100 people responded, which is a decent number. Get that feedback to Soup Micro. And to my uh, amazement, they actually went and made a new SKU, a new motherboard, based on the one I wish they made in the first place, the 12 core, a higher end. It's an additional 500 bucks. But I use those cores at home for like 4K video rendering. Well, guess what? The machine's a whole lot faster at doing that. I have a little. Sorry about that, your remote. So this is me doing 4K video rendering, and I'm just basically showing tables of, uh, yeah, you get what you pay for. With each additional core I buy, um, or use for 4K video rendering, it's handling uh, and finishing the video render job a whole lot quicker. It's not GPU bound, it's CPU bound. This is all at tinkertrade.com forward slash compare, simple URL. Um, okay. Let me pass that. You already heard the history. I want to focus on networking tonight. So we're going to kind of blow through this. That's the timeline. So it's been about a year of product maturity, of bias, and product proliferation where Intel started shipping all the whole bunch of different models. About 15 months in there. The product announcements today from Intel. Did anyone hear those? Anyone have a clue what I'm talking about? <coughs> uh, that was a couple weeks ago, kind of. Uh, here's another one. Here we go. Here. Scalable, what is that about? It's adding colors to the product name, but more important, two and a half times as many VMs can be run on the new generation just announced today by Intel as what was released four years ago. That's a pretty big, bold claim. And you have another company finally making the same bragging points. And here it is, 2.5x VMware going on record saying, yes, Intel's announcement today, we're there day to date, also saying 2.5 times greater VM density compared to what you did about four years ago. The reason? Intel Optane, it's 3D cross point, it's different than all storage you've used for the last few years. And You want to, I have a consumer Octane. There's a little bit of Octane running in here. It's $80. It's not really for its intended use case of the MFS. More important would be something like a discussion here where me and a storage expert in northern Kentucky near Cincinnati got to meet with them. We recorded almost an hour of audio just nerding out about the last nine years of owning uh, NAND-based flash and the problems in the first year being early adopters where the drives were almost $800. They were tiny and we both blew ours up within a month. We had kind of a laugh about it. Flash forward to today, things are getting a lot better with high endurance Intel Optane. So when they announced a new Xeon product line, they're saying in conjunction with the latest and greatest fastest Micron slash Intel invention, Optane, uh, also called 3D Crosspoint, you put those two things together and now you get those amazing speeds. Um, so yeah. All right. Um, so again, on my website, I try to cover that stuff a little bit too. CPUs, AMD Epic, anyone heard that? Or AMD Ryzen or Threadripper? These terms you throw around in kind of the gamer world, Core i7 world, now Core i9 as well. 
not so much my focus. This article is just trying to say, here's what's for data center. And my conclusion that article is basically, guess what, ZMD is not changing this year and it continues to live on. It continues to be a great choice for home uh, labs. There's really no placement been announced by, the, uh, by Intel this year. How does VMware treat AMD? Do they avoid them or? Well, it's been a long like decade of absence. So I think you have to wait a year to see how that goes. As long as, long as the stuff starts showing up on the VMware compatibility list, cool. So um, but it's been so long, the innovation is lacking. You're not, it's not hard to answer that right so today. So you don't know if Ryzen can... Uh, I know triple screen a month ago. So the question was, do, yeah, go ahead. You, you can't run VMware yet on Ryzen? Correct. Um, we have a firmware update. They're said to fix this, but there was a pretty nasty flaw. That's not what you want to see. So they said the workaround is to slow your system down, but you just bought an AMD, right? It's kind of bad. Yeah, Anyhow, a new firmware or something will need to fix it. That's not me bashing Ryzen. It's just saying it's a little bit of a rust start. I mean, obviously, it didn't work with VMware if you couldn't boot it. Uh, purple screen is the equivalent of a kernel panic or blue screen down the windows. Not a good thing. Um, yes, this is great. Because Ryzen wasn't designed for this type of setup, the other chip is the Epic, right? So yeah, Epic's like more for data centers. Yeah, yeah. People are Ryzen. still going to buy Ryzen, just like they buy Intel Nook. Yep, yeah, workstations up. Intel Nook is a workstation. It's never going to be in the VMware compatibility list. But you know what? It tends to work. And that's what a whole lot of home lab enthusiasts. Under $1,000 gets you going to get certified, right? Until those are continue to be popular with that high school. Got a question in the back? Yeah, for those of us who don't work, as I don't work a lot with um, VM machines, mm -hmm. can you say just a few words about the, where they are practical and where they really make sense in the industry? Like how your data, this, this data center that you're practicing with, um, how in, in the business world these VMs uh, are used and, and why they're used? Okay, for me personally, I'll answer I think, the question. Uh, have the ability to run many VMs, what does that do for me? Yeah. Yeah, I'll answer from a personal perspective. Ability to stay sharp on things like Red Hat, SUSEG, competitors, Hyper-V. Having the ability to do all that in one piece of hardware, I'm not rebooting. I can run all that nested, or I can install it natively in the hardware and learn both. Having the ability to do all that on one machine, and not have a, a library of machines or old machines that fire up just to do it. That's a huge bonus for me. And with the ridiculous speed that I'm going to demonstrate for you, I don't want to go back into anything else that's in my basement that I haven't plugged in for years because it's so much slower. And we can do all that operating system testing on a measly 60 or 70 watts. I just leave it running. I fire up a VM in seconds and uh, test it out and keep my skills going. So that's for me personally. But for more fun stuff, like in a home or you have kids with Minecraft server or Plex server, you want to use Plex at home. Yeah, th there's fun stuff, right? You're leaving a, a Windows instance. This thing has way more grunt than you need to run those model shortcuts. Um, so yeah, everyone in the room has different things they do when they're at home lab if they have one at all. And some people just run Oracle VirtualBox or VMware Player on a laptop and that's enough for them because they only run one or two VMs. I'm a little more uh, power using that. I run at least five or six VMs all the time. There are some problems. I mean, I just got through saying there are some problems with Ryzen. Well, we had some purple screens that were reported for ZMD and ZME. Guess what? Intel came out with a BIOS update and went away. The cool thing about having a website is the comments that are right on my homepage, I'll pretty quickly know if something's going wrong out there. That's a good thing. You get 50 people or 40 people in a month saying something. Now when I'm writing an email to Intel or Supermicro or something, it has a little more heft that you have, here's a whole lot of people commenting, something bad is happening. And this just happened with uh, a little company called Samsung. So there we go. Here's a weird one. So it started showing up my site right around Christmas. People were back ordered for months, and the very latest that you're looking at here. And uh, they finally showed up right around Christmas with your Christmas present. You go to reboot the machine, they just the drives would disappear. <laughs> like, oh my god, did I lose all my data? Someone clever just left a comment on my site after a couple of days saying, hey Paul, the workaround is simple. Shut down your OS, unplug the power cord 15 seconds, plug it back in, your drive comes back. Good. Not a great Passing workaround, system. but at Passing least system. the heart palps of your data's gone, you know your data's not gone, just disappeared. Not a great flaw. What do you know? Uh, there was no release notes for Samsung's 
uh, firmware update, but guess what? It fixed the problem. That's that's consumer industry, right? They don't owe consumers anything. Just mm. an RMA or wait for our firmware and, and suck it up. That's bleeding edge, right? That's yeah, it was bleeding edge, and we we smoothed it out. So I say that because tinkering and trying things. That's what I'm. If you the stuff I blog about is stuff I've used and trust. And if something like that is a bump in the road, I'm going to blog about fix when I come up. Hey, your question. So you mentioned about Veeam, Veeam, which is a backup solution. Yeah, Veeam. Yep. Is that what you use funny name. for this device? Yeah, I use that or Nikivo. This is another company that advertises. So free solutions for certified professionals. Almost anything goes, like MSD, uh, MCSE. Anyone have MCSE from like the 90s? Does anyone have an, current MC, uh, have, have an MCSE ever in their career? Wow, very few people have bothered with Microsoft certification. Just curious. Now, what does Veeam back up? VMs. Okay. Yep, but they have a Veeam agent that can back up a physical machine like this laptop too. I use that as well. So you back up each individual virtual machine in a separate backup file? Is that how Veeam works? Yep, it has its own like backup repository for VMs. Is it encrypted? Does it have encryption? Yep. You guys, uh, this is so cool. I've done a lot of these. We're usually like at 20, 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. Your questions are awesome. I'm having so much fun. We're all a little warm, but thank you for being so, like, of all these are done, you guys are like at the top 10% of asking questions, which is great. And I don't, you know, it's fine. That's the whole point of this discussion. So thank you for making this more fun. And hopefully keeping each other awake. Is he probably clients at 88 in here or whatever? I don't know. I haven't even gotten warmed up yet. All right. <laughs> Wait for the Q&A session. Careful what you ask for. So yeah, it, it feels good. The first three years were lean. There would be articles I spent a whole Saturday on and check a month later and only 48 people read them. <laughs> it's a little demeaning and not too compelling to the family. Like, what the heck are you spend your time on? But, uh, I'm glad I didn't give up. And then we just lost the video again. This is great too. Three, two, one, there we go. All right, I tend to blog publicly. Uh, okay, that was me. Um, I tend to publicly say, here's how it works. And I even have an encryption on there. Fine, HTTPS. I did that a little early. No big deal, but Google Analytics and all that. I, for me, that was learning. It's like, oh, this is cool. Thousands of people all visiting, reading articles, what's installing the encryption key like? How about for my content delivery network for me? What's installing the encryption key like there? For me as an IT pro, it's really fun to, to do that stuff out of the cloud and keep my own skills on. Nothing better than doing it on a, a live server, right? It's right through my workload and my day job. You don't tend to get your hands on customer enterprise gear that often. There's nothing quite like having it on your, you know, using it. That's how I, I've learned a lot on the website. I yeah. heard the question we were talking about on our way over here. We're talking about how um, a lot of companies in America, less in Europe, a lot of companies in America spend very little t money and effort on the training of their employees. Yeah. And um, I'm wondering, I was thinking about this, I was thinking like, VMware you know, like, just would make a, a war general laugh himself silly at getting such a return from such a small investment to like buy you $180 worth of whatever. It's like for, for any professional, because once somebody gets to know uh, a, a kind of software, they sell it automatically. It's like you start talking to other people about it. Exactly, you're an IT pro, and yeah. what you tinker with at home tends to somehow make it into the workplace eventually. Right? So I'm, I'm a little puzzled that workplaces don't realize this and and spend a little take like take some time during your work week and say, look, work on your blog. You know that's good for us. I'm just curious whether you've seen more of that, or less of that now. All right. Um, so six years ago, I knew my kids were nearing the end of high school. And my life is going to change, and I'm thinking, I need to. Keep, I'm working at home now, finally, which is great. Teaching me to drive and looking at colleges together was a career goal of mine to live it, to work from home finally, after a dozen years of commuting to IBM Waltham, for instance, and flying all over the country to 35 to 50 states consulting. I did all that, and now it's finally getting to work from home. Um, long hours, being on call on weekends, I had lots of you know, unperks to it, but, but being at home was a big deal. But I'll admit documenting putting myself out there was an intentional thing in that it was notes to my future self because I forget something. That's how a lot of bloggers start, right? You're just documenting some technical little victory, throwing it out there so Google can find it someday and not just yourself. And that was just a kick. That is what eventually led to this job through a long convoluted route of uh, back in 2014, someone finding me across the globe saying, hey, this IBMer 
you should go write IBM Red Books and do software defined storage stuff in Germany for the What do you know? My kids were in college and off I went to Germany. It was really fun. So the blog has led to only good things for me. You guys have heard this many times. I know it's almost passe to have a blog now. People just throw it in WordPress or they throw it on some other hosting site. I get that. If you're only a casual blogger, you only have two or four hours a month, heck yeah, you're going to write somewhere else. You're not going to write a blog. But I'm kind of, I'm really into it as an IT pro and probably, you know, for many years to come. I thought it Couldn't really, want to get older, right? Consulting. I thought of doing that. It was recommended for a real blog because I see a lot of stuff. But I find very few hiring managers even look up my LinkedIn profile. So the person, well, it's all about who you report to, right? And, just, uh, yeah. and the argument is, if they're not looking at my LinkedIn profile, why would they look at a blog that I'm doing? For me, I totally enjoy solving something and blogging about it. That was my primary motivator. The fact that it eventually led to a different a career change was a really nice perk. But it was in that order. I really enjoy working on my writing skills, which are still pretty terrible. I have tons of spelling errors because I'm writing stuff quickly. And we all have very little spare time, right? So you just try to figure something out, document it on Saturday, and then move back to my, be ready for my job again. But having a manager that values it and knows that I'm speaking here tonight and helps do this uh, and evangelize what VMware does a little bit um, and then just nerd out about networking tech, that is making all the difference for my joy and my day job. My day job is now speaking about vSAM, which is basically replacing rig controllers with software rig, and that's what I do. And that's what I was doing three hours ago at the street in Uber at a customer site. Awesome. I got a reason to be near Boston today, not only for you guys, but for a customer. So. I, hope, I don't want to pretend I'm, sh I'm advertising that you should go blog if you don't feel like it. There's some people that don't care about it. I, that's, that's fine. Everyone's different. I'm not claiming it's, it's for everybody. And there's definitely some complications. Um, I like making it fast, so when I pick up an advertiser, I try to redirect that some of the money <coughs> to making the website faster. I don't want someone waiting around five, seven seconds in South Africa to read an article. People bail, right? I just want to go up All right. Content Delivery Network, anyone know what that is? Anybody? Content Delivery Network. Website. Yeah. Website. What Website. content Website. on a website would you put on a Content Delivery Network? A CDN. Video. Or? Articles, blogs. Which parts of the article? Pictures. Pictures. Pictures are the biggie for me. I have a lot of pictures, screenshots. I want them to stream fast. So if you're sitting in Australia, it shouldn't be going over the Pacific Ocean. It should come from a server in Australia, the pictures. And that's what a CDN does for me. So what do you know? I use advertiser money to give some money to a company called Key CDN. It lets me shove the data all over the world. What, what is it called? Pardon? Pardon? The company CDN. that lets you do that? Key Sorry, what? Company? CDN. Key CDN is just one of many. The Key CDN. CDN. CDN 77. Amazon. I did Amazon for two years. It's pretty pricey. It was three or four times the cost. A little more enterprise focused rather than the individual blog. Like caching site, like Akamai Akamai way out of my league for price. <laughs> yes, same, similar idea to Akamai. Good point. The question was about Akamai and caching. So when you go to download a CD from Microsoft, some months when you go to MSDN, if you look in the resource menu, you can see where it's coming from. Sometimes it's Akamai, sometimes it's somewhere else. I think they shop on price and they can compete. But yes, the big companies, when you go to download from VMware, Microsoft, or wherever else you get a big ISO from, they're probably using the content delivery network, an engine network, like Netflix does. So that you're streaming a movie from a server that's in your neighborhood, not across the country with high latency or across the globe. So yeah, being a network audience, I don't know. Anyone, does anyone run a blog in the room on a regular basis? No, okay. so maybe it's, you know, I don't have to into that too much. Um, storage, I don't, you're not pretending to be uh, storage professionals in the room. That's what a large part of the last eight years of my career has been about, is storage. But um, I threw that acronym around, NVMe, right? The gum sticks I keep highlighting up there. Why is it quicker? Because it does away with this protocol over here, this purple view, SAS and SATA. Spinning drives, this top one, spinning rust, it's off the charts. It's way off to the right. The latency is you know, way longer. Uh, SATA and SAS SSDs, NAND-based memory, pretty darn good at reads, not so good at writes. You guys probably know a little bit about that. The write speed is not amazing with NAND flash. 
How about you take it off the SATA bus? Uh, meaning, you know, if these drives or this one right here, that's a SATA cable coming out the back, right? That thin little silvery cable or anything you would put in the front in these hot swap bays. That's SATA, but it's limited to 500 megabytes per second, 540 roughly. Uh, we've capped this, the SSD vendors of why they would see that long ago. How about you buy an aluminum heatsink shrouded NAND solution like these Intel cards? And you put it in a half height, half length, that's what this is. Half height, half length, that's getting pretty common in the server room. Tiny little PCI card. And now, why don't you have four terabytes on there or something? And a big aluminum design to move the heat around a little bit. That's common in the data center. Um, and notice the purple goo goes away. So when you go with NVMe, a new driver stack, the whole old SATA HCI protocol overhead or SAS protocol overhead goes by the wayside. It's a new thing. It was designed for flash from the get-go. When you hear the word Intel Optane and 3D Crosspoint, guess what? The same NVMe driver that's been baked into Red Hat and CSA and Windows and VMware for the last several years, that same driver is what's going to be used for Optane generally, or Intel will have a little faster variant they have, uh, their own NVMe driver. That hasn't changed much, we're all used to drivers. Okay, but these operating systems come with a basic NVMe driver so that you can install the operating system to these NVMe devices, this is the new acronym we learned tonight, and also boot from it. Because if you didn't understand the driver, couldn't see it, well, you were, you, were, you can't install an OS device. Yes? Like in the case of um, VMware, you have to have like 106.5 or is it backwards compatible? All the way back to 5.5, so okay. NVMe driver's been around for years. So. It's true, Windows too, I think 2012 R2 maybe? I might have the wrong. Anyone using, um, who heard of NVMe before tonight? That's a way to word it. Very few, yeah. So. You're going to hear that acronym more and more. If you go to order a Dell machine after today's announcement, or HP machine, or Supermicro, or Lenovo, or whatever, you're going to see that acronym in a drop down list, and you'll hopefully remember it tonight. Oh, yeah, that's the new five or six time faster thing, Paul. I think they ask at this point, but what's that acronym you again, please? Non volatile memory express? Okay. Uh, that's, uh, I think, Intel 20, that one. So it has RAM memory speed. But it's not as fast as DIMMs yet, but Octane's getting a lot quicker. And so the question was, as RAM, it's kind of like RAM that's not volatile. Octane is more like that. NVMe is, a, is still NAND. Though. This screen's all about NAND, and it's been on my uh, here for months. Octane only just arrived like the last month or two. Yes? One more question. Um, I know Dell machines, HPE machines, they started putting dedicated SSDs, internal SSD slots, or whatever. Are they going to change that over to, to uh, instead go with the NVMe dedicated slots? Okay, so SAS is typical today. If you order a Dell server, it's anyone heard of U.2? Another acronym. It looks like a laptop drive, it's just a little taller. So you see this 2.5 inch metal drive here, 2.5. Imagine a little thicker with like aluminum beams on it, that's U.2. That's a hot swap NAND SSD form factor that you typically find in the front of a you know, Dell with a handle and pull it. That's today's world, that's how you hot swap. Tomorrow's world, you've asked about where are we going with this? Because PCIe, PCIe slots are generally not hot swappable. Same thing when you go on the motherboard. The next step with Octane is a year or two out called NVDIMMs, where your storage and your memory live right next to the CPU. Talk about the ultimate simplicity of a server. No more rate adapters, no more fiber channel, no more SAN. You just have CPU, memory, and storage on a motherboard with a whole lot of DIMM slots so that it can handle both memory and storage all in one form factor. That's the way the industry's heading. So you're in for like a big change after a decade of nothing really happening. I mean, really, what happened that big a deal in the last decade? Servers pretty much don't change that much. The speed bumps each year. Great questions. All right. Um, so there's me with a headline trying to say consumer stuff like there is an Optane in this motherboard. It's tiny. It's only 32 gig. So you can run one or two copies of Windows 10 and that's about it. It's really meant to be in a laptop to make that laptop spinning drive feel a whole lot quicker. That's what Intel Optane's marketing is. It's a really fast cache player. So this title is not the most beautiful, but it tries to explain that, uh, yeah, this Intel Optane is really intended for a laptop. Over here, this is for the enterprise server. Big heat sink, lots of aluminum, looks pretty. That's your ultra fast vSAN cache. Your read and write intensive layer for your data center. Remember today's announcement with 
and tell say, hey, we're 2.5 times faster in the data center than four years ago. That's when you buy an Intel server with Intel slash micro developed 3D cross -play. Then you get those ridiculous suites. And then finally today, there's also this kind of weird hack. Red Hat or SLES, it can be an ANX memory extender. So you buy, I don't know, 32 gig of RAM, and then you pretend you have 128 gig of RAM. Three quarters of it is actually an option. It's this memory extender. You're tricking Red Hat or SUSE into thinking it has way more RAM than you do. You save some money. It's called a virtual file. Oh, that concept goes back 20, 30 years. Yeah. I'm not sure where it really came from, but I got stuck in my head several years ago that 64 virtual machines running on a real server was about where you wanted to be. Does that change way up nowadays? Oh, yeah. Way, there's way there's 24 core servers that are tens of thousands with a terabyte of RAM. The yeah. world has grown. So you can run hundreds of VMs on the yeah. Great question. I didn't repeat the question. Uh, but yeah, how much scale on the versus 64 in the old days, max on a machine. If you're running a very lightweight VM in this, this little guy can easily do over 64 VMs. It all depends on which memory he's using. Oh, I remember hearing about some geek 12, 13 years ago, running a machine with eight processors and a gig of RAM per processor. That was weird. Today, who cares? Okay, more reference for a later day. By the way, these are clickable links. So when you get the PDF, remember I told you bit.ly forward slash vnode 2017. That URL, you'll have a PDF. These are all clickable. So the article that's underlying this little screenshot, it'll just jump right to the article. All right, live demo. That's what I really want to make sure I have. So again, um, this discussion, and then we all break, we all leave for the night at 9. Like I need to be packed up, shut down, and out of here at 9. Or we just stop talking at 9. All the discussion ends at 9. Before 9. Before we be out of here now. So when does discussion end? What time? But eight forty-five. Okay, let's get to the live demo. Then. So I'm going to jump and skip some of these other things. Where I have videos on my site about all of them, and actually show you some stuff. So let me uh, minimize everything. So, okay, what are we looking at here? A bunch of shortcuts. So if you use Chrome, you may know it has a feature where you can create handy dandy. Not on your tray, it just. It's edge maps is that part of your. Yep, this is the OS running in the edge writer. Light. So let me uh, beef up the font so you can actually see things a little better. Whoa. Hmm. Okay, let's turn off the mouse wheel free spinning and do clicking. That's a little. Um, it's not going to be a. Deal. When people in the back of the room to say it. So deep packet inspection. This little $80, $90 router can even do that. And guess what? You can see the different VMs. Here's what my laptop's doing. Here's what speed it's getting. And this gives you some sense of what these machines are doing um, as far as workload. Um, Which from the resolution, we can't show everything. But. Yeah, what part are you using? Pardon? <laughs> what router are you using? Yep. <coughs> This one's easy. I just posted this article a couple hours ago. Got it for you guys tonight. So it's right here. Uh, that's the router I'm using. And Amazon and New Way Blinks. And you'll see, people are pretty fond of it. Four and a half stars for something that's so affordable on Amazon. That ain't bad. And it's been out for four years. So you think uh, something faster would have come out, but actually, no. I think you do a million packets, which means at home, I have. Um, how does it compare with a Netgear N600? <coughs> Way faster. So at home I have, uh, here's my, do I tweet this? Let's see what I got. Is it the Wi-Fi down there? Also? Here we go. No. Can you guys see that? It's a what? There's no Wi-Fi, you kind of off it. I'm going to cover that in a minute. The question was about Wi-Fi, what am I doing? I'll cover that in a second. But just stay with me for a moment. At home, I'm blessed with 300 megabits down and 30 up. Um, and I'm forgetting the name of the person that emailed me about this. Is that person here? Someone was thinking of driving. They were going back and forth in this tweet. Maybe the person did. But anyhow, that is quite a blessing. And to have a router that can keep up with it and not slow me down, all the consumer ones failed. They were failing around 150, 160 megabits when I first started testing them. About two years ago, last summer, I finally went over to this was it, $93, what Amazon said? Went over to this router, completely solved that problem. Absolute, full speeds, um, 
And that's wired or Wi-Fi. I'll tell her how I do Wi-Fi with a different device a year ago. It's a brain I can. A whole year ago. I've had enormous success with that combination. So this number is really tough because we're also talking about things like buffer bloat, net gear, links is all over consumery. They are friendly to use and things like port forwarding and stuff, pretty straightforward. This one, you have to make it look like a consumer router. When you first open it and box it and connect it, I'm working on a video on that process, but its firmware is two years back level and it kind of expects you to be a command line. But you really feel like opening up a 200 page PDF after learning the command line? You get started? No, you update the firmware and then it becomes much more like a consumer friendly router. So I'm going to show you DCP reservations and DNS setup as the, live, the parts of the live demo. And then finally finish off with a quick clone operation. All right. So yeah, speeds are good. Um, services, actions, leases. All right, so DHCP admin. What are the mystery devices? Uh, there we go, a W310. What the heck is that? That's the school's workstation that jumped on my network to do this demo for me. Right? So I didn't have a DCP reservation, it just gave it to 11. Fine, let's move on. The reservations tab is where all the kind of magic happens. So I light up a new server on my home, and then I assign, yeah, I take here, let me show you an example. So suppose I wanted to make a fixed static IP for this Windows machine, I could change the IP right there and give it a different name. <coughs> take a hand, but up. Um, with the static mapping page, Sure. Yeah, maybe. Really There's only like four minutes left for live demo. Let me just cruise through demo. So this is a whole bunch of servers at home. This is what I went to VMworld with, uh, Xeon D1518. Flew to VMworld, and when I booted this rig, that little router made sure everyone had the same IP every time. It's that simple. So I made these few reservations. We're in a network user group. Most of you probably know a bit about that. Their MAC address reservations. The MAC address says, hey, give me a lease. The router slash DNS server slash DHCP server. This ubiquity edge router. Uh, Grants the same IP every time. So moving right along. How about DNS? Let me show you what I mean by. Yep. This little guy on the right, I retired my uh, Linksys on the left, I put in an Eero, three of those hockey pucks around the house with wired backhaul. That's how I get those fantastic speeds in every room of the house. So that 300 megabytes I showed you was after trying a competitor called Luma. And then finally realized. Some of those mesh routers? Yeah, these were now Best Buy, widely available. There's lots of competitors now, it's a year later. And when you know, they just came out with a new release of uh, Eero. But the speeds, look at that. Anywhere in my house, I'm getting wired or wireless. I'm getting this. I'm getting what I'm paying for uh, communications for, which is wonderful. So and I'm it's not stable. Not understanding the wireless part. Okay. So this combo, the thing on the left is not even plugged into anything. The router here yeah. is featured here tonight. That's my DHCP DNS and routing functions. This is just bridge mode, passing everything through. It's just the way a Wi-Fi device jumps onto the it's same network that this guy is controlling. It's an access point. Yeah, they call it, it, they call it mesh because not everyone has the ability to do a gigabit cable to it. So you plug in one <laughs> cable mode and the other two in your house are just plugged in and meshing. But I don't use the mesh, I use wired backhaul. I get amazing speed there. Great question, yeah, so, yes? All right, more questions. So the demo, what is all this stuff here? Well. How about our server we're looking at tonight? So you see me point to a server, like the one that's on the table here. ZMD1541, and we log into it, and there's its web UI. ZMD1541-5028. Uh, and there it is. It's IP address 41. So now you're looking at my DNS table, right? So what does that mean? It means if I go to Windows, and I go MS lookup, 10.10.1.41, it gives me Whoops, my funnel to is open. I'm going to close my funnel. Gives me a, a DNS response. You probably can't see that file too much. But anyhow, remember I told you earlier, you need to look up the machine by name or IP for VMware work rate? Well, that's what this router is doing for me. Um, how about
The one that's in front of you is the ND 1541. So I got a mistake there. It's right here. It's IP address 21. There we go. <coughs> Still standing up, failed me. So forward and reverse lookup work. What, why am I showing you that? It's not that exciting. But the point is, you have a Linux machine at your home. It tries to see Windows friends in the same network by name. It'll work fine with this $93 router. That's the point. So your Windows and Linux machines are talking to each other by name. You make bookmarks in your browser by name. And notice here, vSphere relies on certificates, and we don't get nasty browser warnings if you do it like that. Something like VCSA logging in here. Notice secure icon. So VCSA applies. VSphere has its own certificate authority running the VM that's running off of one of those two thumbsticks. And it gives me the green happy checkbox in my URL. So basically, not hacking Etsy host files is, is not a great way, or hard coding everything with IP is not a great way to do a home lab with VSphere. It's kind of picky about the ends. That's the really my motivator for buying this router and finding a low cost point that anyone can. It doesn't care that you don't have Active Directory at home? Correct. I know Active Directory running at home. And, uh, and here, so my motivator was this. Um, go here to videos. We go to the popular ones. And that's popular. That's a lot of people looking at that video, how to build a lab. Mm -hmm. It's an older video. And it's using a link. This kind of a weird hack I did, including editing host files, which I'm now ashamed of. Once I found this router, I'm a lot prouder of using that. And it tried to like roadshow rather than editing host files. Okay, so more features of the router before we wrap here. Um, you saw staple packet inspection, you saw a little bit of that. Uh, updating firmware, not a big deal. Click on system on the bottom and point to an upgrade file. There's a very active user community Ubiquity has, and that's the point of my article here. The thing I published today, right in the home page, right here, in the state, is. Me saying you have a very active community. It's been around for some years. It comes out with one or two, maybe even three firmware updates a year. That is a lot of support. When I went and made a post there, when I had a little bit of a problem, no problem, and in here, they had a little flaw on a new firmware update. And then I came up with a solution. That alone, I posted on the forum the community. Within like eight hours, somebody answered it. I'm like, cool, I'm going to go blog about it, give you credit for it, and we can all move on. That's an active community. You don't get that with a Linksys or D-Link. They're only interested in selling you the next year's model. They stop that's updating the firmware after you hear it in your host. So that's that's bashing or being brutal, but my gosh, I've run home routers since you know 3Com ISDN days in the early 90s. I, I wouldn't use Linksys or D-Link. Some were pretty stable. It wasn't so much that, this thing. But again, once my internet speed at home became 300 megabits down, all that consumer stuff went by the wayside. I couldn't keep up with the Doxy 3 cable over the basement. Okay, ask questions now? I think so. I, I suppose, yeah. On the, on the other side here, when you start more moving up in the commercial world of routers, and, and again, it's detrimental to speed, but you see the concept of universal threat management rolled in to Cisco and Sonic walls and things like that. Um, how does, you know, for, 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 for supposedly better security, contrast that with what you have here. In short, NSX would be the product that's in that email experience for 180 bucks that lets you do that. Perimeter networking is basically software defined network firewall. So I talked about vSAN tonight, this logo and vSAN and taking a bunch of drives and making them look like one, like a RAID 5 like construct or RAID 6. NSX is the equivalent for hardware firewalls, those one U appliances you ran uh, in a rack. Why not do them software? And that's VMware's pitch with NSX. And now, you, as a networking pro, anyone can download NSX. That was that under your job that I showed earlier. Uh, so yeah, the question was just about how do you do this? The UGM you can also do, sorry, PFSense in a VM is another way to go. Is that up? Yeah. Many ways to get in there. Anyone run PFSense at all? So yep. you would recommend running a relatively low-end commercial router like this one, but adding the firewall feature, software firewall feature. Yeah, sorry, you weren't really asking about software. You're saying, can this thing do it? Well, let's see. If you do IPsec and OpenSSL VPN, 
Can it do fancier routing in the firewall stuff built in with some sort of package you need to add to its Linux? Maybe that was really your question. Thank you for sharing it. Um, I don't know. So if these firewall rules aren't enough, like you can see I'm doing one port forward right now. Uh, so I'm doing an RDP port forward, policies, um, here's the rules. This is, um, yeah, but you get into you know, you know, threat management, you get into advanced This is VPN not that, I have that through this. Do you think it's something more durable physically than the Netgears and the other ones? Seems physically, yeah. I mean, it's actually getting a little warm because I got it next to the candy switch. That's the thing that's warm. And we live like that. Can I ask one more question about the wireless? Yeah, while you're doing that, I'm actually going to do one quick demo. Go ahead. About wireless. Okay. Yeah. A lot of people ask the question how do I get free coverage in my home? And I was a little unclear. You have that single white device, the e device, yeah. attached to your router. Yep. And you said you have several more. Are they, are they hardwired in? Yeah, have, but they don't have to be. So most houses would have only one wired straight to the cable bottom. And straight out of Best Buy, you plug in this white thing to your cable bottom, and then you go over to their house and place a couple more just plugged into the wall, and they mesh with each other, and now you blank your house and wi That's how the product's designed, consumer. And then I'm not doing that, though. It's called the Euro? Correct. I went and plugged it in to give it a wired backhaul for more speed, and I went and said, hey, on a little app on my phone, which is pretty darn simple, Tap, 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 say, I want it in bridge mode. I don't want Eero DNS and DHCP routing. I want to do that with my existing thing. Turn on bridge mode, and now it just became dumb access points, which is exactly what I wanted for my home. Speed tap and speed chop? I, mean, I would know I'm on wired back home, right? So my whole house is great. Yeah, I mean, I put one in every floor. Okay. Yeah, no? Usually the speed comes in half. Yeah, and if people have like a 3,000 square foot house or something big with brick, you know, you can have challenges. challenge if you're buying four. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, there's still physics involved. It's not a miracle, but yeah. Mesh networking has really helped that industry. Let me uh, make sure I have time to show you this. The thing I promised, and that is, when you have a list of VMs here, here's one called Windows 10, built 1703, all right? Let me go ahead and say, new VM from the sampler, and say, yes. From 960 uh, Pro to 960. You want me to just double check that's what I have installed up front here? Nope. Uh, yeah, 960 Pro in the bottom is where the template lives. The template is a 15 gig file, a VM, and it's going to be cloned to the 960 Evo. Uh, nope, I got that wrong, sorry. 960 Evo to the one in the bottom, so top to bottom, Evo to Pro. And it's going to be blinking LED lights as it clones. Evo slower. Uh, slightly. It's definitely more affordable. So one terabyte Evo to nine sixty four. Yep. Yep. But it's still highlighting how ridiculously fast the storage is. Now you're seeing yellow bangs because it's a little angry at me. It's like, hey, where's this other machine that was the only fifty six seven? Well, it's back at home, hundred miles away. Um, 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 yeah, you have to remove that before the clone. <coughs> and you know, the spoiler alert on the video is eight seconds. So 15 gig and eight seconds from one to another. Let me just uh, see the manual clone file here. Whoa, I have a mouse jump like that. So it's not going to let me do it the right way. Let me just go data store browser. There's the top drive. <coughs> Can you go over your 10 gig network and come back? I don't have another node here, I only have one. Right. My laptop is not 10 gig. Right. If my laptop was 10 gig, yes. And you guys might notice a little uh, chuckler in there. It's OS2, I am running, right? Oh, there it is. Does it work? Oh, yeah. yeah. I'll be uh, doing a little fun article about that. So we'll yeah. And then you're going to watch my uh, skills of breaking this thing down in a hurry. Um, so manual clone here. The top drive to the bottom. Uh, it doesn't really matter what VM I clone. I'm just get one going. So that's a VMware clone. Correct. One VM to another. It can be a running VM or it can be powered off. Uh, it doesn't <coughs> really matter. Where 
Correct, because they broke the server. server. No, he's he's using, found it this yeah, but he's doing it yeah, at the server level. Right there, uh, not the, yeah, this the is how you would be able to copy it. All he's trying to do is a file system copy of any sort, just so you can see the uh, drive linking. But while I'm setting that up, go ahead and ask me questions about networking or whatever. I mean, I highlighted the basics, TCP, DNS, very briefly. The article gets into a lot more about how I set it up. Like when you get a new host, make a DHCP reservation, get, give it a name, a short name, a long name, and a hard code that I And that's it for time. Can you explain uh, more about the vSAN, virtual SAN, concept, application on that? Is that deploying the, the storage together? Uh, yeah, I'll try to make it fast. So, a RAID card, you have maybe four drives attached to it in a RAID 5. One drive dies, your RAID is degraded, but you can still have access to your data at a slower speed. Just a basic recap of RAID. Now, vSAN, what if you have four of these servers, they can be one you, four little guys in a rack, one you. What if you have four servers tied together with 10 gig? So, there's no SATA cabling, there's no RAID adapter, there's just four servers, compute, memory, and storage inside of each of them, typically SSDs these days, interconnected with 10 gig. What does that get you? It gets you a vSAN. It gets you one aggregate lump of really fast storage that lives on all four nodes at once. So when you light up a VM, guess what? That stress on your SSDs is spread across four machines. So you can bet it's really fast. So that's vSAN in a nutshell. You unplug the power on one of those four nodes, just like a RAID 5, it's still going to be running with three nodes left. It has some resilience there too. Now vSAN can be more complicated than that. You can have six nodes and it can handle two hosts going down. You can put a bunch of drives inside each host for more resilience within the host. Way more time than I have to cover tonight. But thank you for asking what vSAN is about. It's about replacing your RAID controller thinking caps of your old days of buying high-end RAID controllers. <coughs> Instead, use that money to divert it into investing in higher-end SSDs that are big, like four terabytes, with a nice thin octane skin of incredibly fast cache on it. Or, more typical today, just a better write endurance and a new PCIe card or um, U.2 drive. Wow, man, I give you a fire hose for an hour. You're probably uh, some head spinning. Yeah, I guess yeah, so one last question, I suppose. So, so the VSAN, I mean, yep. you'll have your drive in each of these servers that will position it, and part of it will be the storage from that server, and part of it will be the computation uh, of the storage from one of the other servers. Exactly, everyone's contributing. Yeah, so everybody has some of their own and some part of someone else's. So any node goes down, whoever has the, you know, the backup will, will take over. Yep, anyone want one of these? Don't want one of them? Right at the camera. Who said the camera? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Nobody gets hurt, very lightweight. Isn't that just some confusion with Nantix this time? There is a difference with Nutanix. It's running in a VM, whereas vSAN is running on all the hypervisors. Big grid of the hypervisor. There is no single VM. Um, just different approaches with competitors. Microsoft does the other different approach. Thank you very much. Yeah, I guess come on up. I'll be gracefully shutting this down at 30.0 wires. So, see what little flip lights in the router coming up next.